Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up With Giants TV. It's a special Father's Day edition. Have you ever wondered how to make a difference? Our next guest knows. Good morning, Giants. Welcome to Wake Up with Giants TV. I'm Ryan Morris, and as always, I am here with your host, Nicholas T. Smith, the mythical giant. He is here live and in charge. Uh, if you haven't followed us on Facebook, the Tribe of Giants, just go to Facebook, join our group. It's awesome. It's a fun little group, and it's growing fast, so maybe it won't be a little group forever. It'll be a big group, a giant group, if you will. Uh, if you haven't followed us on uh, social media on YouTube, Wake up with Giants TV. You can subscribe right now. <laughs> and now. And now. Yeah. Yeah. Anytime you want. And uh, we've got a killer guest. I am so excited. I've been waiting for this one for a while. As soon as I heard that he had accepted the invite, I was pretty dang pumped up because uh, he's related to one of our league member, uh, our league members. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Just related. So he's, he's like related. family. He's a, he's a family giant. Perfect. So, uh, yeah. Do you want me to introduce him? Maybe. I'm just waiting for that invite. Nick, will you introduce? Yeah. I'll, I'll Nick, will you introduce our guest today? <laughs> yeah. We've got Brian McGill. Uh, he's currently principal at Alta High School, and he's been in the Canyon School District. His, his wife, his daughter, his son are all graduates or soon to be graduates of Alta. Uh, he, he's got five degrees. He's been pushing for over 12 years. Is that right? As an ad man? Yeah, school administrator for the last 12, 13 years. Yeah. And then about nine years as a principal. The dude is jacked. I mean, 30 years of working out will do that to you. And so he's got some principles that show grit. Uh, he's he's powerful. He actually created a first ever official uh, early college pathway called Step to the U, where students save $15,000 in tuition. And uh, let's see. Is that right? Maybe I'm saying that wrong. So yeah, they, you know, it's 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 spot on. So yeah, we, we created uh, an early college pathway at Alta in partnership with the University of Utah. And basically our students between junior and senior year and right after their senior year, they take two summer blocks yeah. uh, of 12 university hours. It costs them $180 total. And basically they walk out with a general education certificate. So it saves them two years of time. Okay, okay. Tens of thousands in tuition and kids are, are having a lot of success. In fact, we've doubled the numbers that have participated the last couple of years. So it's been really cool. Well, you're also a YouTube sensation with your dance video. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, call it that, call it whatever yeah. you want. Yeah, man, a little bit of this, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. yeah, my my, uh, my dance teacher, um, you know, being at Alta for seven years now, she had hit me up the first three or four years. She's like, we got to get you out there at the Hello Assembly, do some kind of hip hop routine with our girls. And I was like, no, like, I'm not a dancer, you know, get me in the weight room. I'm good. Right. Don't put me yeah, on the dance yeah. floor. And I don't know, for whatever reason, year five, I was like, I had a little bit of time in the summer and I was like, all right, if the girls would be patient with me and uh, we do a little rehearsal in the dance room to get it down. Yeah. Right. Um, I said, I'll give it a shot. And so, uh, so we did, we opened up our hello assembly a couple of years ago and uh, I'll tell you what, the kids just, I mean, they ate that stuff up. They went crazy. It, it was pretty fun. Um, yeah. Automatic connection with my student body. I could, I could see that. It went nuts. I, mean, I, yeah. I saw the video, <laughs> and at the end of that video, oh my gosh, they they were like, oh, oh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it was cool because it was a, a surprise, right? Like the dance company came out, they they danced like the first minute and a half, and all of a sudden I kind of came out and closed it out with them. So it, it was a good time. And you're a skater. Now we're seeing this. Yeah, too. Nicole's going to tell everywhere. all your secrets too. Yeah. We love this, oh, Nicole. Just keep yeah, feeding them through. This is perfect. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, you know, I, I was kind of always, I was, you know, I grew up um, with great parents who loved me and supported me and guided me. And my father, you know, really, really pushed me in all things, which I'm, I'm very grateful for um, because it's made me who I am, you know, today. And through that, um, basically, he, you know, he pushed me hard enough that it's like, I, you know, I, I try to strive to be the best in everything that I do. And, yeah. and the same 
held true with the, the skateboarding line. So I was an athlete. I played football, baseball, soccer growing up, even did some tennis in high school, played collegiate soccer. Uh, but skateboarding was a big part of my life. I grew up in Arizona. And so you could skate pretty much year round, you know, as a kid because of the, the nice weather. And so I really took to that. And uh, I moved here to, to Utah uh, during junior high and kept up my skateboarding skill set. And <clears throat> when I was um, like 14 or 15, uh, classic skating and Sandy used to have these uh, competitions about every three months or so. And they would have like a sponsored rider or pro come in as well. And uh, I had entered a couple competitions and done okay. And then I think it was like my third competition I entered into that um, there's like 260, you know, qualifiers that competed. And I ended up taking first place um, wow. out of the whole thing. And they, they pushed me up to like the pro sponsor division. And I got a local sponsorship through Wasatch Skates and, my parents were thrilled with that because then all of a sudden it meant free decks and, you know, yeah, yeah. on, on uh, you know, boards and clothing and stuff like that. But uh, to give you an idea, this this was me when I was like 14, 15, just going off a lawn tramp there in the front of my house. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah. that, was, that was my life for, you know, probably a good four or five years. And um, thought I was going to do that for a career, as a matter of fact, um, until I got this thing called a driver's license and discovered girls. In high school, <laughs> the skateboard kind of took a backseat to all that at that point. Yeah, kind of weird like, how hey, that happens. Yeah, yeah. So let's uh, let's go into your story. I mean, anything that I've forgotten. The cool thing is about our our viewers is that they're they're following up with principal of the year skateboarder. Like we got all these things. So don't don't feel bad if I missed it in your bio. They've got you. <laughs> but let's let's go back in time. Let's talk about growing up. What was life like as a kid? What were your parents like? What was your experience there? Yeah, I had a great childhood, to be honest. Like I said, I grew up in Arizona. Um, you know, I look at I look at the generation of youth coming up through now versus kind of the experience that that I had as a, a child. And obviously, this was before, yeah. you know, technology and cell phones and Internet and social media and all that stuff that these kids basically are born right out of the shoot with. But um, for me, I think growing up, I had, you know, a lot of connections with lots of kids. Um, I just remember running around the neighborhood as a child and, you know, playing cops and robbers and uh, swimming like crazy. You know, in Arizona, it's hot. Right. So pretty much you get done with school. And the question of the day is, all right, which pool are we swimming at today? Uh, um, but I just remember being outside a lot and playing a lot and just enjoying life and, um, you know, coming in for dinner each evening. We'd all sort of get called in about the same time. We'd go in, we'd rush in, eat 15 minutes. We'd pop back out, play some street football, play some street t-ball, um, you know, hide and seek, all that kind of fun stuff, right? And, and I yeah. think social sort of development that comes from that is a really healthy thing. And I think a lot of the kids nowadays miss out on, on a lot of those opportunities. But I uh, grew up in a, in a great home, you know, loving parents. My mom, very nurturing, uh, very loving Um she was the coolest mom. Like she would, she would step in and, and help no matter what. Um, I was in a, I was in a band when I was in my teenage years and uh, we used to play some shows downtown here in Salt Lake. And I remember um, I was 15 at the time. And then two of my band members were 14 and we had a 13 year old. We were a pretty young group. And uh, she loaded up our blazer with all of our equipment and drove us down to this place called the Speedway Cafe, which was like, Fifth South, Fifth West, under the Biducks, kind of you know sketchy yeah, part of yeah. town back then. Yeah, and that's just the kind of mom she was. Um, right. She, you know, and and she came, she dropped us off, and she came back down at one, two o'clock in the morning, picked us up. Wow, like, wow. like it was you know no big deal. And yeah, I mean the the role of having a loving and, and nurturing mom like her, um, you know, is, is I think instilled. I tell people a lot of times I have kind of a hard exterior, but a soft interior and def definitely yeah. soft interior came from um, my relationship with my mom uh, who's got Alzheimer's now. So that's been, that's been tough, so, uh, uh, you know, enduring through that over these last like five, six years that she's been diagnosed. Um, my father, um, very loving. Um, you know, he was a great role model in terms of his work ethic. Uh, the guy put in, you know, 10, 11, 12 hour work days, Worked his tail off uh, so that financially we could have the things that 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 you know that we needed. Um, we weren't rich by any means, but we weren't poor, right? We had we had the means met, and that came through by way of my dad. 
Yeah. And I saw that, you know, as a child. And, you know, when you're young, you don't always necessarily pick up on that fact. In some ways, I almost had some resentment because he, he worked late hours. Right. And it's like, well, why is he not around? But mm. in hindsight, it's like he was working his tail off so that we could have the very things that we had, you know, food on the table, clothes, you know, being able to, to, to drive a car, you know, that he supported me with and things of that nature. So, I mean, I really had a great childhood growing up. Um, my dad was was really hard on me, um, but like I said, I think in a lot of ways that was a positive thing because it's really molded and shaped my mindset of who I am today. And uh, you know, he he was one of those that he used to always instill in me: um, you got to be the best at everything you do. You know, you're McGill. Your name, if your name's behind it, dang it, it better be you know the best it can possibly be. Wow. And so I'm always in everything that I do in life. I try to strive. Um, to be at the top and, you know, whether that's grades in school, whether it's skateboarding, um, you know, whether and, it's listening, and it all, whatever. it all comes easy, right? Like it's just easy. You just, you're a McGill and it, and you don't have to work for it. And, uh, and it just happens magically, right? I wish, man. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. No, I, you know, it's interesting. I have, uh, you know, I think the difference a lot of times in people's lives is, whether they rely upon being intrinsically motivated or extrinsically motivated. And yeah. I think there's a lot of people in life that they do things um, because they want to have some sort of award or reward at attached with it or associated yeah. with it. Right. Yep. And, and until they get that, it's like, well, I'm not going to put the effort in or I'm not going to try, but I've always been a believer in, in having that internal flame being lit at all times and, and being very driven and going after things in life because you want to do it for the sake of doing it not necessarily just doing it because, you know, I'm going to get a bigger paycheck or, you know, I'm going to get this out of it, um, you know, some sort of external reward, if that makes sense. But I think that's really the difference maker in a lot of people's lives is, and with every individual trying to find that internal drive is different, right? Yeah. Um, what makes one person tick may not necessarily make another person tick. So for all of us, it's really about doing that deep self-reflection and trying to figure out you know, what we want in life, setting short term goals to, to work towards that and then obviously hitting long term goals, but also never being done in the process. Right. Yeah. Okay. Always continuing to strive to, you know, with that growth mindset of, of driving further and further and further towards, you know, feeling some internal um, internal reward. Right. Versus the external or extrinsic rewards that come with stuff. It, it seems like when people get the external reward. Um, it's short lived. Like it'll be experienced. It's fun. It's nice to have that recognition and then it's gone. And then you're back out there and there's no, there's no fulfillment, long-term fulfillment in it. Yeah. And so you're constantly pursuing that external fulfillment. And as I, as I hear your life here, I want to reflect back a little bit and tie it into the journey is you had parents that were giants. I mean, they, they taught you work ethic. They taught you love acceptance um, your potential, you kind of had a sandlot upbringing in a way, like where you go yeah. out and play with friends and hang out and grow and have that social connection, but you still had to go on your own giant's journey to figure out what you wanted. So it wasn't like, well, I was, I stood on my shoulders or my parents' shoulders and I'm done. It's like, I still had to go out and develop my internal flame and work toward that, whatever that was. So did you, did you know what that was when you started down your path? Was it clear or did it kind of evolve as you went? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, making the transition from high school to college and trying to figure out, you know, life per se, or what you want to do from a career pursuit standpoint. Yeah. Um, for me, there were, there were really three things that I had an interest and desire in. Uh, one of those was, was fitness. Um, okay. I ended up getting a minor in exercise sports science. Um, and with my undergraduate degree, um, another part of it was technology. I had a love and passion and pursuit for technology. And, and again, early nineties, mid nineties, it was just as the internet was starting to come about and websites were just starting to be developed. And I kind of jumped on the bandwagon of that and created some websites for my schools and stuff at that time that I was involved with. Um, but really the biggest, um, biggest thing for me or the biggest key that I found in doing a lot of soul searching in terms of what I wanted to do with my life. Um, was really make just being a positive influence and a positive difference maker in in kids' lives. And 
as far as the pursuit of that, I, I was unsure um, in my, during my undergraduate years exactly what that journey was going to be or where I was going to end up. Um, I had some great experiences in high school, um, three influential individuals in my life. One was my little league baseball coach. His name is Pete Cannell. Um, he didn't have any kids, any boys on the team, but he gave up every afternoon, every evening during the week. And um, it taught me a lot, right? In terms of somebody that gave of himself and his desire and his interest and passion in the, in the sport of baseball. Um, and he was, a, he was an awesome coach. And that really taught me a lot, you know, standing on the sidelines and watching him interact with us and the investment of time that he put in into developing us as young men. Um, I was in, involved with peer leadership team in a high school, um, PLT as they call it. And that basically is a program where you uh, connect with other kids at your school as well as do a lot of activities with elementary age students. So we'd go to local elementaries. We do like drug prevention, um, you know, sessions with them. We would play games, you know, just connecting, um, you know, with the little kids. And I just really, really took to that. I had a lot of desire and passion for, um, for what that did. Um, and then I had an English teacher that um, instilled confidence in me in my junior year. Uh, I wrote an essay and turned it in and she did some one-on-one -on -one reflection with all of us in class. And I remember her calling me up and um, you know, I'll never forget exactly where I was sitting, time and place. And she said, you know, Brian, you really have a gift with writing. She's like, I'm not just saying that, like you, you're a great writer and you really need to pursue this. You need to do something with it. Um, and that was really for me, like one of the first times in my life where I had a teacher really pull me aside and just kind of give me that one on one time. And wow. it was amazing. Just that one positive experience, what that that did for me in terms of confidence and feeling efficacious in my learning and and that sort of thing. Uh, I got but, pulled aside a lot. What's that? <laughs> usually, I said I got pulled, got pulled aside, aside a lot. A lot yeah. yeah. Usually it was, though, like uh, uh, you're being way too loud. Um, <laughs> you're disrupting the rest of the class. And uh, go see Principal McGill. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so through undergrad, um, I kind of decided to pursue um, psychology. And and I, I thought to myself, well, I'm going to go after a master's. And I uh, started a clinical psychology master's degree because I was thinking about becoming a licensed therapist and working with youth in that setting in that regard. Um, but then through the program I was doing, they also had this bridge where you could actually get another master's by taking like an extra six classes in school counseling. And I thought, huh, well, that kind of opens up more doors. Right. So as you're looking for career paths and stuff, I thought, well, more options are better than than limited options. So I decided to take those extra classes and pursue that and ended up getting a master's in clinical psych and then school counseling. And I did a practicum um, at a local high school. And that was mid nineties, 95, 96. And really from that time, that point forward, um, being in the school setting, I was like, this is it. This is where I want to be. This is the environment. I love yeah, yeah. Focus on academics and counseling kids and the sports piece of it. And just the community that a comprehensive high school lends itself to being. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, 24 years later, I, I ended up pursuing, I, I taught for a limited period of time at the middle school. I was a counselor at the middle school and the high school level. Um, I coached sports at the high school level and then went into school admin and got a third master's in school administration in 2007, 2008 um, and became a school administrator and was an assistant principal at the middle school level, um, assistant principal at the high school level. And then I've been a principal at two different high schools, um, Academy for Math, Engineering and Science, which is an early college high school in partnership yeah. with the University of Utah. And then, um, you know, the last seven years at Alta. Um, so that really was kind of my educational and kind of career pursuit. And yeah. So so really a, a straight and narrow path from where you started to where you are. Right. Like, yeah. no, no branching. <laughs> no branching. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to throw that out there a little, you know, uh, in jest because, man, you, you went down a path and a door opened. And behind that door were eight other doors. And then you open that door and it opened eight other doors or nine other doors. And you're looking at all these options and you arrive at this place called being a principal. And, and that's not it. But you arrive in this place that feels like home. Like, this is me. This is what I want to be, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, the cool thing was, um, 
when you talk about branching off, I, I really did branch off because my yeah. father, he was a steel draftsman detailer, uh, his brothers, draftsman detailers, hmm. um, a good part of them. And, uh, you know, his, his father did that as well. My grandfather did that. And, you know, I don't know, there's just knowing me and my personality and my persona. I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't see myself sitting behind a desk, like drawing tedious straight lines for 12 hours a day. Like, yeah. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, not going to happen, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I, I don't know, I guess just that, uh, as we talk about intrinsic and extrinsic rewards, you know, the, the beauty of my job day in and day out is I have intrinsic rewards that I walk away with every day. And when I get the letters from kids, um, you know, letting me know the difference and the positive impact I've made in their life. A lot of times I had, I had no idea with some of these kids, like I knew them, you know, on the surface, but they must've been observing and watching and watching and uh, seeing me mentor them, you know, through whatever organization activity or, or class that they may have been at the time. Um, but for me, that's the reward in, in doing the work is, is the kids, you know, and putting your priority emphasis on them and creating policies that, um, that advocate for them, that make a positive difference. Um, and like I said, it comes back to, you know, connections with them at the school level as well. I mean, that's, that's really the joy in my job is I deal with a lot of problems, right. As a principal, usually by the time things hit my desk or things get to my level, it's like people have exhausted other means to, to yeah. get to where they need. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I can step back and, you know, I can go to a basketball game. I can go to a choir concert. Um, I can go walk the lunchrooms, right. Go visit a couple classrooms and it just brings, brings everything back, right. In terms of, all right, this is why I'm here. And this yeah. is the purpose and this is the why of why I chose this. And I think it's important to never lose sight of that um, because that continually propels you and drives you further forward. Um, and it also keeps you grounded too, which I think is really, really important that, uh, you know, just because I'm the principal doesn't necessarily put me here and others here. Uh, I've always been a believer in kind of lateral leadership style mm -hmm. and almost in the sense that I'm facilitating things going on in a school community. Yes, I'm leading and I'm guiding that by, you know, decision making, but I'm also not doing it by myself, right? It takes all of us. It takes the whole team, the whole yeah. school. Um, and my job is to transform them so that they are instilling the same philosophies and pursuits and positive influence that I think kids um, should have at, at, you know, at the school level. So, I'm, I'm sure they feel that. You said a word and it might have been by accident, but I think it was awesome. You just made it up. Watchering, right? Oh, yeah. 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 They're like watching and mentoring your kids. And, yeah. and then that lateral leadership uh, is powerful because you're not putting yourself ahead or above anybody. You're really putting yourself alongside them and looking at it from, I would say from their perspective so that they could see a way through because you're right there with them. It, it's not like you're over here saying, Hey, come over here and look where I'm seeing it from. So you can see my way you're going back to where they are and showing them the paths and the possibilities. And yeah. so how has, how has that impacted things as far as, uh, I, I guess the growth that you've seen, let me see where I want to take this. Um, like how has it impacted the growth that you've seen in the students and your peers when you lead laterally? So again, I think a lot of it comes back to, you know, a big part of my job is, is building relational trust, uh, with the, you know, I have 200 adults in my building that I'm technically responsible for. I have 2,400 yeah. students, 2,400 families, right. That are interconnected to my community. Man. And I joke around a lot of times, it's almost like being the mayor of a little city with a bunch of youth. Yeah, uh, yeah. And their parents along along for the ride as well. Um, but, you know, it's a lot of it has to do with with making connections and being empathetic towards kids causes. And okay. one of the things I think that's always helped me in my role. Um, and I think it's probably my counseling background that, that comes with this. But and I honestly don't know how I do my job as a principal without that counseling background, because it's so much of the skill set that I use every day. But when I get a kid and a parent sitting across from me and we're trying to do some problem resolution, I always try to ask myself if, if I was the father sitting here or the mother sitting here and this was my child, my son or daughter, how would I want this movie to be played out? And a lot of times there's, mm -hmm. there's usually something that's occurred or something that's happened. And, you know, I have to abide by policy. Right. But on but at the same time, 
what I find a lot of times is like the issues here and policy says this, but a lot of times we have to navigate kind of that gray area in between. Hmm. And at the end of the day, I always try to ask myself, you know, what, what's the, what's the best decision working with the means that I have um, to help advocate for this child in this situation at this time. And then working through the parameters of what that takes to help that child and parent get to yeah. where, where they need to be. But I think that that empathy and that connection and trying to just understand exactly their feelings and their perspective and where they're coming from um, is really important to not not ever lose sight of that. that it's not about me. It's about them. And, and like I said, I'm there to help facilitate them getting to where they need to be or finding the right resolution to whatever problem is your concern um, that's having. So, so I think, you know, a lot of it comes down to relational trust and building connections and, um, and having fun right in the process yeah, too, yeah. of working with kids. I, I see it when you say, you know, how do I want this movie to be played out? I see you doing that not only with the parents and the kids, but also in the school of, of how do I want this movie to play out? You look at physiologically what you've created there. How do I want this movie to play out? And then you don't worry so much about the pathway. You worry about the vision. And then you navigate the pathway. And that's what I hear in what you're saying is you're navigating it. It's not like you can see a clear path from where you are to how to get to that. You allow the energy to kind of rule. And so as a philosophy for those that are listening is that the vision of how, how do I want this movie to play out? What do I want in the end? And that, that could be in a micro scale and that could be in a macro scale. Like, how do you want it to play out and then just navigate the vision? I, I, that's what we do in, in the giants and the smalls is we have a vision. And in some cases, it's pretty grandiose. It's pretty out there. How we're going to do that, a lot of times we don't know. So we just follow the energy. Yeah. Has that been a philosophy of yours for life or did that come about? You mentioned the counseling, that that helped with that. Yeah. Um, you know, it's funny when people ask what I do, a lot of times, you know, obviously being a principal, you're a principal, right? But I think yeah. I think delving even further behind that, more into depth, is um, I look at myself as almost like an engineer of human capital in a way. Yeah. Um, because there's so many intersections and cross sections with my work and my day to day interactions with everyone that I that I work with um, that really you're engineering, like you said, a vision for a school community. And I'm the person that is leading and driving and, and guiding that. And uh, I look I look at that, you know, in the context of like what my father did being a draftsman. Well, there's a lot of engineering involved with that. Right. Um, yeah. And, and his brother's doing the same and my grandfather doing the same. So in a lot of ways, there's a lot of parallels with what they did versus what I do, just in a different context. Um, you know, one of those being more of a kind of a private office setting, the other being more of an external focus, more social yeah. um, relevancy in terms of, you know, working with tons of people day in and day out. Um, but it, but it's fun. You know, it's part of the part of the beauty is, is that unknown. Right. But having a vision for where you'd like to see things go. Yeah like the creation of this early college pathway. Um, you know, it was a seed planted in my head of what could be and okay. I knew, knew it would require a lot of work to get us to where we needed to be. And obviously I needed the you alongside with me and on board with the vision and the partnership and all that. And when I finally got the opportunity, you know, it took forever to get a, a meeting scheduled with, with the president Ruth Watkins up there at the time and a couple of uh, the vice presidents and assistant vice presidents but like half half hour into my presentation, um, President Watkins is like, Brian, I'm just going to stop you right now. <laughs> She's like, I just came back from our Korean campus and we actually just instituted a program almost identical, almost parallel to what what you're you've established or what you've created here. Yeah. And I spent almost a whole year just late nights creating the conceptual framework around, you know, the program, the application process, um, you know, summary of information of what the program is, the benefits, the outcomes for kids. Um, you know, the staffing, the resources, the cost, you know, all of that. And because I knew like if I, if I had a shot to get in front of her, like I needed I needed to make it happen. Right. Yeah. So there was a lot of preparatory work that went into that. And it was kind of funny once we had our first application cycle go through and we had actually names with faces with kids actually looking to participate for that first time. Um, one of the assistant vice presidents up at the U, she, she and I had worked pretty closely together in developing and building this, this path. 
um, she pulled me aside one day, just she and I opened her office and she's like, Brian, I gotta be honest with you. She's like, I never thought in a million years, like <laughs> this would, would go anywhere or that we'd have any kids even want to, you know, apply or participate in it. Um, but man, to see five years into the process now, and we've gone from 40, 40 kids participating in each cohort up to 80, and now we've got 160 kids participating, wow. which collectively is like 2.8 million saved with those 160 students going through year in and year out. I mean, it's mm -hmm. very, very significant. But huh. I think what's even more important to me than the savings of time and money that these kids get is how much growth that they um, see in themselves. And uh, when I pursued my doctorate degree, I did my whole defense and doctoral dissertation on the, the intrinsic rewards and intrinsic outcomes of these students within the program. And uh, just like that English teacher did for me, man, these kids now, they're taking university classes and they're having confidence in their learning. They're learning how to write. They're learning how to, to annotate and critically think and support arguments. And, um, you know, the soft skills part of it is, is, is the positive development that they ended up getting through the program. And one of the cool things that we've seen from that is these kids, they end up uh, taking on even more challenging classes during their senior year after they do that junior summer block. And it's helping propel these kids, right? These kids now, I mean, I, I'm getting letters from kids that just telling me thanks because they, they spent two years at a college or university and they've got their bachelor's degree, right? They're yeah. Well, funny yeah. from their bachelor's and they're like, I'm looking at grad school or I'm looking at med school or, and it's just awesome to see, you know, the seed that's planted in your head come to, you know, an actual reality of kids and faces and names of them actually, you know, finding success in something that you had a little bit of a hand in creating. Uh, and again, my driving force for all of that was, was really the kids and trying to alleviate barriers for college um, because cost is a huge issue and time is another huge issue, right? So if we can help on both of those fronts, uh, why wouldn't we? Yeah. And the benefit to the university um, is there, we're now getting more kids from Alta that are pursuing the University of Utah than we've ever had before. Wow. And with that, I'm sure they're probably getting a lot of kids that want to do grad school up there now too, right? So, so let me let me ask you this. So, you know, in my book, I've got the journey where the small goes and finds the giant. He he gets to stand on the giant's shoulder and see the world, but the small goes out and pursues it. And I would imagine in the school that there will be some kids that aren't actively pursuing that. And as a giant, you know, in your world, you're going back to them. That I, I kind of want to talk about that, that there are some cases where you might be coming to them and helping them to see that that's even a possibility for them, like waking them up to that as a possibility. Yeah. And, you know, I one of the things that I pre COVID year that, that we did was I would do an, an assembly for the entire junior class. OK, so I'd invite them all down to the auditorium. Uh, I had like a half hour presentation that we put together, me and a coordinator from the U. Um, every kid walked out of that auditorium with two things, um, a step to the UT shirt, uh, which was very cheap on my end to produce and provide for them. Yeah. Um, but then also the application process. And I made the application process very, very simplified. It's a one page front and back side, um, because I didn't want that to be a barrier for kids to apply to get into the program. And it was amazing to me that first run, that first go through, uh, we did a Q and A session at the end and I invited parents in as well so they could get their questions answered. And I could tell just after that, that first assembly that we held, how much interest and enthusiasm it had, it had generated. Cause I had a lot of kids yeah. come up one-on-one -on -one after the assembly wanting to ask me, you know, additional questions and that. And then the cool thing about the program is that once we had one group go through and then another group go through, well, of course, they're talking with their friends and they're talking with their friends and they're asking him. So what was it like? You know, what did what did you find, you know, by participating? Was it worth it? You know, because these kids are having to invest nine weeks, three days a week, five, six hours a day out of their summer uh, in university studies and they're high school kids. Right. Um, but through those peer to peer influences, I mean, that's made a huge positive impact and difference because kids are talking to other kids about the successes that they've had and how much they've enjoyed the program and how much their learning has grown as a result of it. Um, but 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 even on top of doing the assembly piece, um, I actually make individual classroom visits with certain classes to ensure that we're 
that I'm like strongly encouraging kids that maybe otherwise might think that this might not be something for me yeah. um, and to make it reasonable, to make it doable and to, you know, try to light a flame within, within them, right. To pursue yeah. this particular path. And so it's been really cool over the last five years to see the diversity grow in terms of the, the types of students and the number of students that are applying and participating in the program. Um, that's been really rewarding to watch. I'm, I'm having a vision here of a, a gardener, you know, a gardener can plant a seed and look over that, that seed, right? But the seed, if it were planted and left alone in isolation, a lot of times it will fail because it needs that peer to peer connection. So with, with other peers, when you have that root connection with other seeds, there's a communication and support system that grows in nature for that seed to be even more successful. And so a single seed can make it, but it's a lot harder than if you had multiple seeds planted because they, they tend to communicate and work together. And I, I could see like you as a gardener, you can only go so far in a way that, that you need that peer to peer support for those kids to really grow. I see that in the tribe of giants is that we have this group of people that are growing together and supporting each other. That if they're, you know, if I'm not there as a support, somebody else is, if Ryan's not there, somebody else is. Um, because it's really hard. I, I could imagine, let me rephrase that. I, it's not possible for, for Brian McGill to be in all places at once and to have full energy at once in all places. So to have that support elsewhere is necessary for you to maximize what you're creating. Does that sound about right? Or what comes yeah, up? In, fa in fact, the, I mean, the leadership principle, and I think I spoke to this a little bit earlier is this yep. term is transformational leadership, right? Huh. And that's, you're absolutely right. I've, I've found myself many a times like kind of joking, like I need to triplicate myself or <laughs> I need to create a 3D fax of myself so I can yeah. be here and be there. And, you know, I mean, at a high school every night, there's four or five activities going on. Right. Yeah. And I, want, I want the kids to know that I'm there to support them genuinely and authentically. And whether that's a sporting event, whether it's theater, whether it's choir, whether it's band, whether it's debate, whether it's a club, um, you know, I want those kids to feel like if they see me and recognize me there, it's like, Hey, we've got the principal here. Right. Um, so I found myself a lot of times, you know, asking that very question. It's like, I can't be at five places at, at once. And so how do I, how do you, how do you, you know, get your vision established and shared throughout and have others carry alongside that vision and that same philosophy and same style. And approach yeah. you have? Well, you have to transform them. Mm. So by me sharing, my vision and my philosophy and getting others on board with the process of that, basically what you find is a lot of people will instill or institute the same behaviors um, that you instill and that you mentor and that you provide to kids. Right. And so it becomes yeah. this larger scale entity of, you know, Brian's visions and Brian's philosophies and Brian's views are carried out by the masses of the other adults in the building. And in fact, in some cases, the kids, right. Student body officers and PLT advisors and, we have link crew leaders that mentor the the freshmen as they come up through um, just creating that culture of community and, and that positive vibe, you know, through transforming others um, so that it is, you know, spread school wide. Yeah, I love that. So what uh, Hugh just said there, it's it's um, can you bring that back up, Ryan? So keeping what you have by giving it away. And in a, in a way, your vision never goes away, but you're transforming in others. You're building that vision and lighting that in others. They're choosing into it, but then it's it's like they take that on as their light, and now they're going out. Your vision's still intact, and so is theirs, and it's not. It doesn't take away. That's the beauty of abundance: is that it it doesn't mean there's one or the other. It's not an or thing. It's an and and thing. And I would so I want to I want to go down the rabbit hole a little bit of resilience. So bouncing back, grit, perseverance. Can we talk about that? Kind of your your philosophies around that? Yeah. Um, you know, I've, like I said, I think a lot of it, it was instituted in how I was raised. Um, my dad, you know, you know, I've, the older you get, the more you're able to kind of reflect and understand and have, yeah. you know, authentic conversations about, Hey, why'd you raise me this way? Or why were you so hard on me? You know, that kind of a thing. And, um, you know, I, I really have to hand it to him because, he said to me um, just a couple of years ago, he's like, you know, Brian, I saw a lot of potential in you and I didn't want that potential to, to, to go untapped. 
Yeah. And he said, so I, you know, I raised you in a way in the manner in which I felt was best and that, that I knew how to do. And yes, I was hard on you. Um, you know, he, as, as he coined or termed it, he's like, sorry, I raised you executionary style. Uh, he didn't raise <laughs> no. me executionary style, but he did have a high set of expectations for me. And yeah. I knew at the end of the day, if I didn't give my all and I didn't give my best and my name or his name is behind it, right. Then there's a price to pay for that. Um, and he's like in all things in life, whether it's school, whether it's sport, whether it's, you know, loving your sister, loving your mom, like you have to give it your all. And I think that that helped plant a seed within me at a very young age that you always strive to be the best you can be. And, you know, you have to win the day. Um, and what I mean by that is, is you take advantage of every minute of every hour of the day, um, to do something that's positive, that's going to benefit you and benefit others. And uh, I've always had kind of this like warrior mindset or warrior mentality. Um, you know, we all have a fight or flight response system, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you can either and you can either choose to fight and show that grit and show that resilience and show that perseverance, or you can flight and just bail out. Yeah. And yeah. I've never been one to bail out, and I, I. A lot of that has to do with the fact of, of as to how I was raised and the expectations that were set forth. But I also got to see my dad work extremely hard in his career. Yeah. And, and through observations and watching that, um, I saw firsthand like how hard my dad worked. And just mm -hmm. because he did one particular career role, um, it taught me to do the same and whatever I set my mind to. And so, like I said, whether it's skateboarding, whether it's school, whether it's, you know, being a husband, being a father, um, you know, principal and educator, youth advocate, yeah. whether it's being in the weight room, like I'm going to give it my all, I'm going to, I'm going to give it my best. And um, that win the day mentality and attitude and having that warrior mindset or that warrior mentality, I think is really important because when we choose to fight things and I'm not talking like literally fighting, I'm talking a mindset of this is not an easy situation. Um, or, you know, perhaps maybe there's conflict or there's confusion. You have to figure out a means and a way to, um, to come out ahead of the game. And I think a lot of that has to do with, again, just that having that mindset of, um, I'm going to give this my all. And, uh, you know, Nick and I were talking just pre-show about fitness and, and working out and stuff. And yeah, I was telling him, you know, I, I work out usually 8 30, 9 o'clock at night. It's about 11, 11 30. I'll spend two, two and a half, three hours just about every day uh, in the weight room. And my son and I have been able to do that collectively together. My son's on the autism spectrum and it's done wonders for him over the last two and a half years. Um, but as we were talking, you know, it would be very easy for me come 8 30, 9 o'clock at the end of the yeah, day yeah. after working yeah. 12, 13, 14, sometimes 15 hour days as a high school principal to be like, you know what? I, my head's just going to hit the pillow. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm calling it good, but I know for me having that, that workout time, that quiet time, that Zen time where I can put my headphones on and zone out from the world for a couple hours and hit reset, um, that that makes me be a better father, husband, principal, uh, individual the following day. And so, yes, towards the end of the week, you know, you sacrifice a little bit of sleep in the process of doing that. And, and yeah, yeah, I mean, come Thursday, Friday now, the older I get, it's like, man, I'm tired. Yeah. But I also wouldn't trade it for anything. And, um, and you know, so it's really winning the day from the time that you wake up until the time your, your head does hit the pillow um, of taking advantage of every moment, of every opportunity and making the best of it. Um, and again, that is, a, that's a mindset, right? That's a drive that all, all of it. Have have. You, yeah. We were talking earlier about, you know, somebody coming up and asking you, how did you get so ripped so big, you know, and, and you could share the, the method, but the trade-off is they want the, the shortcut. Like, how do I shortcut this? And you're one of your answers back to somebody that asked you that was, well, go, go to the gym two to three hours a day. Right. Now do that for 30 years like I did, right? And and we get into that space of, I don't want to do the 30-year thing. I've, if we look at the picture and we really knew what it took to get there, there's, there's this idea that it would be overwhelming and that we wouldn't want to do it. And so there's a blessing in a way of not knowing the full picture. 
if if you just said, hey, do it two to three hours a day and stick with that for a week and now go for a month and go for a year. And then that repeats over time. And with with that repetition, there creates complexity in the body and the mind and everything else. And so with with uh, humans working with humans, I, that we're all humans here, is that when we have that broad picture, it's really hard to hold on to that. If I had to do that for 30 years, it's hard to hold on to a picture of what 30 years looks like but I can hold on for a week or a month. What are you yeah. hearing that? Yeah. You know, it's funny as, as we were talking, I'll, I'll get kids, you know, late teens, early twenties, you know, yeah. young adults coming up to me all the time at the gym and they're like, dude, I want to look just like you, man. Like what's your secret as if like, I just did it from yesterday to today. Right. Yeah. 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 And I'm like, well, first of all, I haven't always looked like this. Uh, secondly, I was blessed with some amazing genetics. My dad yeah. is built like a brick house. Um, he's got probably the biggest legs I think I've ever seen on an individual and that's not yeah. even working out. Like he's huh. just, he's just built. My mom on the other hand was dark complected lean. Um, and I kind of yeah. got the best of, of both byproducts. So DNA and genetics is obviously a huge part of it. Right. Um, I'm a mesomorph build. I can build fast twitch muscle fiber like really quick. And I found that out as a high school aged kid. I was like, wow, like I got in the weight room and I saw results pretty quick. Um, it doesn't always happen for everyone. Right. Because you, yeah. you have to kind of work with with what you're given. Um, I'm not the guy that you're going to see running the 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 10 mile, you know, the yeah. five K, yeah. the 10 mile, the marathon. Like, could I do it? Yeah, I'm sure if I trained and worked towards that. But genetically speaking, uh, I'm built for more of that sprint, that, you know, uh, quick lift, you know, yeah. the, the, I'm just wired that way genetically. And so, um, so through that, you know, sticking it out for as long as I have 30 years, there's only really been one point in my, in my life that I took any time off. And that's when we had my daughter in 2002. And that was yeah. like, that just rocked my world. I was like, I was working, I was going to school, I was coaching, Yeah, you know, I've got my wife to take care of. And it's like, holy crap, like, what is this? You know, I mean, because you're now giving of yourself to someone else 24 seven, right? Yeah. All yeah. hours of the night and day and, and then still trying to function. And I, and I remember I ended up taking about 14 months off completely. Didn't do any cardio, didn't go to the gym. Yeah. Uh, I kept telling myself month after month, Hey, I can kick it back up. I can start, you know, whenever I want 14 months. And I'm telling you, I've been I've been through a lot of challenges in my life. That was probably one of the most difficult, most challenging things I ever did was to have gone from working out five, six days a week, two, three hours a day, the strongest I'd ever been, late 20s, take that kind of time off. And then how long it took me to even just build it somewhat back was like probably an eight to 10 month, you know, cycle of trying to get back to to even yeah. remotely close to where I was. But I remember telling myself and I told my wife, I'm like, because I remember looking at pictures of me and stuff and I just, I was, I was like, I was ashamed in a way. I was like, how did I, how did I do this? You know, how did I, how did I just let this go? Now, granted, you know, there was a child that was born and that's right. kind of the X factor that's thrown into things and that changes your world. Uh, but at the end of the day, I was like, you know what, I'm a better father. I'm a better husband if I am doing this. And because I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm striving to be a better individual and yeah. I'll be better for them you know, if I choose, if I choose this path. So really from that point forward and prior to that, you know, like I said, it's five, six days a week, two, three hours a day cardio. I take two muscle groups, a large muscle group, smaller muscle group. I'll rotate through them. I do antagonistic muscles. So opposite muscle groups, most people do complementary muscle groups together. Yeah. But, uh, about eight years ago, I really dialed up the nutrition side of it. So obviously weightlifting is a lifestyle. Fitness is a lifestyle, right? right. So a lot of people use the terms diet, right? Well, most people that go on a diet, it lasts like two weeks, right? And then they're like sure. ice cream and cookies and right, you know, right. creams and going to town, right? So it's really a lifestyle. Um, you just have to choose. And it makes it a lot easier, I think, just in terms of from a mindset perspective that I'm not going on a diet. This is just how I live. It's who it's who I am. It's yeah. how I eat. It's what I put in my body. My, you know, what I put in my body fuels um, who I am and what I look like. And how I feel. And uh, so about eight years ago, I really dialed up the nutrition side of things and eat, you know, a high lean protein diet, a lot of grilled chicken, a lot of turkey, a lot of low fat cheeses. I try to watch like my carbs, my sugars, my saturated fats. I don't cut those out by any means because you need yeah. that energy at the gym. I just yep. don't need a ton of it, you know, and I don't, 
I'll eat a ton of dessert and, uh, you know, I might have a bite, right. If we, if my wife or kids, yeah, yeah. Up, I have a bite or two and call it good. And, um, but for me, the older I was getting, you know, being 47 now, late thirties, early forties, your metabolism starts to slow down. Yeah. And I was like, Holy cow. Like I've always lifted, I've always been strong and this and that and the other, but I was finding that it was harder and harder to stay vascular and lean and keep your body fat percentage down. So the nutrition side of it has really been key. Um, and I started to see results within about a six to eight month span and was really liking the results that I was getting. And so that just basically kind of helped reciprocate the decision. Yeah, making okay. yeah. day out. Uh, wow. Like I'm seeing great results. So, you know, that discipline of when the cookies are laid out in front of you or you know, at a school, there's always treats laid out yep. in office counter. You know, so these people brought donuts in, these people brought cookies. There's all yep. that stuff, right? And, and my staff's always like, how do you, how do you not just like partake? I think, you know? I think that's every job ever. <laughs> yes, like yesterday at my job, they brought cookies. in like ice cream sandwiches <laughs> yeah. and donuts and all kinds of stuff because it was hot outside, right? Right, yeah. right, right. And there was like every kind of ice cream bar. I work at a dealership and so that, you know, and they make a decent amount of money. So they spend a decent amount on their salespeople. Yeah. And they threw it. I mean, it was like any kind of ice cream bar sandwich that you could think about that, you yeah. know, the, the fat boys love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So those those got thrown out in front of me. And because I've been doing that same thing, I mean, as far as mental discipline in a diet. Yeah. You go. Yeah. Yeah. It's OK. I choose something different. Yeah. Well, for me, it's I look at the cookie or I look at the donut and I'm like, you know what? That's like a half hour on the treadmill. Yeah, wow. Well, you know, wow. and you start There's you start computing it from a numerical yeah. perspective, right? Like a checking account, like your incoming outgoing. It's well, not calories, worth it anymore, right? Calories is the same, right? Intaking and and burning them off, right? It's the ins and the outs. And so it's just having that mindset of I'm working hard. I like my results. Do I really want to screw with my results? Or yeah. just just keep at it with what I've got. And and I think from a mindset perspective, that helps. And when I'm working out religiously, routinely, it's a lot easier for me to eat really, really clean. If I go on vacation or if I, you know, take a few days off, which I've done here and there, man, by the time that third or fourth day hits, I find myself, well, you know, one soda isn't so bad, you know, yeah, um, yeah. I can have a cookie. Well, that cookie was really good. I can have another half of a cookie, right? Yeah. And then, uh, and then pretty soon it's like, I'm feeling guilt. Cause it's like, I know I'm not supposed to be doing this, but it's amazing how intact the mind body connection is. Yeah. And when you are, you know, exhausting yourself physically day in and day out and training as hard as, as someone like myself to not amp it up with the right nutrition, uh, and to really be able to take full advantage of the outcome for me, um, it's a mindset thing that I just, I don't want to. I don't want to disrupt that. Or I just look like a up. creeper sniffing the ice cream bars. Just give me a Come here, you're bring this donut past store. my nose. Yeah, yeah my, my colleagues, you know, when, we, when we've gone out to eat and stuff here and there, um, they they always joke around with me because I'll always ask for the dessert menu, but I never order off of it. <laughs> and so for me, it's kind of like I look at everything. I'm man, that all looks so good. Oh, it's fantastic. Here you go, waiter. And, you know, I hand the menu back to him, and they're yeah. like, "Like, what? You always ask for the menu, but you never order anything. Like, what's up with that?" You I was just like, "I just want to look in your head." I'm just right? curious, like, you know, what do they offer up? Yeah. yeah. Well, so I would ask you, you know, maybe wisdom as we get close to the end here of this this interview. If somebody's starting their journey, you know, whether that's a high school student, a kid, somebody that's that's older, they're starting their journey. Say hi to everybody. What what piece of wisdom would you share uh, with them as they get onto that journey? What would you want, have wanted to know or want to have known? I don't know how to say that. We'll say it correctly some way well, if you I were think, starting out. I think first and foremost, um, it takes a lot of self-reflection. Um, and it, it takes a lot of um, looking at yourself internally in terms of what your passions and your interests and your desires are in terms yeah. of what you enjoy in life. And, and that could be, you know, pursuits of interest 
and means of hobbies. It could be what you're learning, learning in school. It could be your career path of what you want to set out uh, your sights to become, right, as an individual in a career setting. But I think first and foremost, you, you've got to take a deep, you know, down dive into who you are as an individual and what those passions and pursuits are that you that you want to go after in life. And then from there, it's really building a roadmap, right? Um, your your long term goal or your end result of that vision of what you want to accomplish and what you want to go out and achieve. You have to then start to do some backward design in terms of, all right, this is where I want to be. So let's take the case. I know I want to be a high school principal. Well, you know, obviously having some teaching as a background, having some counseling as a background, having been a coach are all sort of preludes uh, into helping me become a better you know, school administrator in terms of that experience, that knowledge, that insight, that decision making, the connection. Um, you've really got to look at that end result and then you've got to you've got to create a roadmap of short term goals, multiple short term goals that are going to help you meet step one and then step two and then step three. And and Nicholas, I think you hit it right out of the onset of the interview um, that, you know, you're never you're never truly really done. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. When I was a teacher and landed my first teaching contract, I was like, wow, I've arrived, right? And then yep. pretty soon it's like, I'm a guidance counselor. Well, I've arrived. And then I was coaching. Well, I've arrived. Then yeah. school administration. Well, I've arrived. Well, you go from assistant principal to principal. But now I have my my sights, professionally speaking, set on becoming like a, a school district superintendent at some given yeah. time. Now, for me right now, probably not within the next 10 years because I love working with kids and yeah, I want to yeah. remove that element uh, and that variable from my day-to-day -day work because that's what yeah. brings me passion and joy. Um, but you never really fully arrive. You're always continuing to, to grow. You're always continuing to push yourself. You're always continuing to set more and more goals and, and meeting those short term end term means you're meeting your long term and then so on and so forth. And you just have to keep that, that pattern I, and that rhythm going. Yeah, I hear a pattern in this that I love and I really want to highlight it, right? Is you have your vision and here's the distinction between entitlement and capacity. Like entitlement says, I have the vision, I deserve it. Capacity says, I'm going to do what I need to do to grow in capacity to have that vision be a reality and be in integrity with that vision. So it means not only can I have that vision, but I can, I have the capacity to run that vision. And then also like what you mentioned right now is you might have a vision of becoming a superintendent, but you love where you're at. You enjoy your capacity that you're in. And it's almost like, yeah, there will be a lot of peaks, but the challenge is enjoying every peak that you reach, finding satisfaction where you're at, because there's this tendency to look at the vision and, and it's never enough. You're never satisfied where you are. And what I hear as a distinction in yours is one, you're always building your capacity to support the vision that you have and you're satisfied in the capacity that you're in. And so I, I see it as, this is my word here that I use a lot, fractaled, right? You're, there's never an end to the peaks that you're going to reach. And so you're just going, going, going. But you're building yourself as you do that. You're enjoying your life as you do that. There's satisfaction in where you're at as you do that. So it's not like there's an end because there is no end. It's like where you are is the end, but there's also more. It's, it's a paradox in a way. Yeah, I mean, the, the saying goes, the process is more important than the outcome, right? Yeah, okay. And the process in the pursuit of what we're doing in the moment at this yeah. given juncture in time is what is developing and building us to actually enjoy the outcome, but yeah. you don't, you don't work towards just wanting to have the outcome or wanting to have the award or wanting to have the reward that comes yeah. as a byproduct yeah. of yeah. the pursuit and the process in which you develop or build capacity, as you put it. It's what yeah. you're learning in that process, right? All those lessons, all the things that the experiences good or bad, you know, uh, difficult, they refine you, they make you who you are and who you want to become. It's that I, I love that. I love that. And you, so, my friend, have become a giant. Physically, <laughs> mentally, emotionally, spiritually. I, I haven't asked you to do this yet. But, yeah. I mean, you got to go. Oh, so yeah. Fun. There we go. You put me to shame. 
So, <laughs> Ryan, Ryan's holding it up there. Ryan, Ryan says my next career step is pro wrestling. So, yeah. John, yeah, Cena, there Ryan, you, go. you guys got nothing on me, man. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go. Yeah. yeah. The principal. Yeah. You got to do what the rock right. is cooking. Yeah. yeah. I can see it now, man. You know, yeah. We'll come out in your suit. You could have like the paddle, right? The principal paddle. Yes. Right. Yes. The ambiance about the it. paddle with holes drilled in it. And everything. Yeah. Exactly. So Ryan, I'm I'm curious as you've listened because you've been uh, you've been in in that reflection state through this, and I'm wondering what what came up for you as you've listened to this interview. You know, so I wrote down a bunch of words in on the uh, on the paper, um, and I it was commitment, time, perseverance, dedication, drive, grit, habits, discipline, routine, schedule. There's a whole bunch more that I I didn't write down that have flowed through my mind as as this is going on and all of those didn't happen all at once some of those were learned and some of those were were put into action and you started building habits and discipline and and but you had a commitment not just to the kids and and everything else but you had a commitment to yourself and your family and what you wanted to be and you you've you're killing it you're doing it you're doing it you're doing exactly that and uh, those kids, I, I, I'm, I'm a little jealous. Like I wish I went to Murray High School, but now I'm kind of wishing, you know, that I was at Alta. You know, I could go back to school. Maybe I can come back and enroll. We'll start True, over. Man. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, <laughs> know a guy, I know a guy. I know a guy that can help get you in. <laughs> yes, sweet. yes, and then I can go to the. <laughs> U, wasn't go there U. a movie about that? <laughs> like going back to high, I don't want to go. Yeah, back to well, yeah, I'm good. Yeah, a little Billy yeah. Madison action. We'll just yeah. go back and start yeah. it over again, and and. Uh, but I'm I, I I'm a little jealous. Those kids are super super lucky um, to have somebody like you in their lives. I know that the the staff and the people that are there are blessed because of your leadership. And uh, those guys are are I'm sure a lot of them are stepping up as they see you. You know, live live into your giant potential. Those staff members they elevate too. It's a rising tide lifts all ships, right? It's that it's that concept. I like the lateral, you know. There, you're looking behind and making sure. Okay, hey, don't fall too far behind. Let's go. Come on, I got you. And you're lifting everybody as you go, as as you step forward. And uh, I I don't know, man. I I'm just impressed. I know you're a heck of a guy, a heck of a father. You got a, a really strong last name. Those McGills. I know those McGills. <laughs> and uh, you're doing it proud, man. You're doing the name proud. And uh, I appreciate you spending some time with us. You know, I, I also thought about our school visits that we've been able to do. And you talked about um, the difference and, and seeing those kids and being a, a even a small part, even if you didn't know you were a part of their lives and they came up to you later and said, hey, thank you. You made my high school experience amazing. And I learned this from you or that, whatever. Going into elementary um, schools um, and being able to share the Giants' journey and to help them understand that they have giant potential, it's already within them, and to help them believe in themselves has is that feeling. They, man, there's nothing like it in the world. I'm telling you, I, that's why I do what I do too, is because of that. I, I, hmm. It's there's something so special about seeing the light in a kid's eyes come back or to ignite or to burn brighter. Uh, I, I don't know. And so what you're doing is so worthy. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can uh, we can do something with you in the future again. And uh, we're going to we're going to be on the sidelines cheering you on. And maybe we'll come to one of your dance performances. That, that'd be <laughs> awesome, man. Yeah. You never know. The hello assembly is it's always a. Uh... It's yeah. always a mystery as to what the principal is going to do. You just never yeah. know. Yeah. So, Brian, is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up? Um, not that I can think of right offhand. I just, you know, hopefully your you guys and your audience and that have been able to, uh, you know, take some wins away from what we've discussed and talked about today. And um, just going off of what Ryan just said, you know, helping others believe in themselves. Um, you know, just in wrapping up, I, a couple of weeks ago, I had a uh, voicemail right towards the end of the school year from a kid I worked with 18 years ago. Huh. Uh, I was a counselor at a particular local high school here. And I haven't talked to this kid or seen this kid in 18 years. And I had a voicemail on my phone from him 
that basically said, you helped me during a, a really rough period of time in my life. This was a young man that had everything going for him, was doing well in school, and through some, some home environmental stuff that took place that was pretty severe, pretty significant, um, he basically withdrew and became very depressed and um, started really struggling in school. Yeah. So a young man I took under my wings and saw just about every week for about a three year span. And we got him through, we got him graduated, you know, and uh, he left me a voicemail that basically said, I uh, just wanted to let you know that um, I am who I am today because of you and, and what you did for me. And he says, you believed in me at a time in my life when nobody else believed in, in me, including myself. And he said, that belief in me is what propelled me to, to become who I am today. And he said, I'm a successful father, husband, uh, business owner. He's, very, he's done very well for himself, very lucrative in his business. And he basically said to me, he goes, he goes, I want to stop by and just tell you thanks. And uh, as a means of my thanks, I want to give a contribution and donation to the school oh, wow. so that you, can, you in turn can pay it forward to other kids. Hmm. And so, you know, I think maybe like in closing and wrapping up, like there's nothing more important in life than giving of yourself to others and help and helping build others up. Yeah, I had others do that for me and, and I'm just looking to do the same. And I'm fortunate and blessed in my career to be able to do that day in and day out and to get paid for it. Um, but I guess that, that would be kind of my parting message. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Thanks for being on here, um, man. Happy Father's Day. Thanks for being happy Father's Day to you guys. Such yeah. a solid father and, and sharing your, your experience with your dad as well. And uh, man, being a father in a way to all these students. It's incredible. So, yeah, yeah I, I joke around with people all the time. They ask me how many kids I have. And I say, well, <laughs> I've got 2,354 kids. And they look at me like, I mean, we are in Utah and all, right? Yeah, right. They're like, yeah, <laughs> you're busy. Uh, and I say, two of those are my own. You know, the other, yeah. the other 2,352 are, are yeah. in my school. But, uh, but I do. I try to take pride and ownership in, in all my kids in the community. And, uh, you know, I love – being an unorthodox styled principal. And I think the kids have really gravitated towards that too. Uh, they know that I'm in their court, that yeah. I'm there to back them up. And uh, anyway. Yeah, I love that. Perfect. I love it. So for those that are watching, continue to do giant things. Thanks for being a part of this show. We'll see you in the next episode. Ryan, I'll let you finish this out. Love you too.